I think you're showing us some of that right brain energy <laughs> that we, we need. Um, and, and so a slightly sobering tale there from Julie about how that in some ways we've passed this high watermark in some ways of interest and, and budget for this, for this exercise, but that there are real lessons and that maybe we should reflect that as a, as a profession, as a group, we sometimes uh, respond to right brain energy with left brain sort of tools. Always a welcome message in my day job that we need a strong WHO. So uh, maybe we'll move on to, to, to Jimmy to sort of talk about the global response and how do we sustain that and, and the US's role in, in facilitating that. Very good. And I, I took my responsibilities much too literally because I first, first of all, I did talk about the three questions I was asked to address about how can top level government leaders, including heads of state, be persuaded to invest in preparedness? What role the US should take in leading the way in corralling global political and financial support? And then the role of global health security agenda and the joint external evaluations. But I applied them to microbial threats, perhaps because of the many days KG and I spent together on antimicrobial resistance. And so it'll be a wonderful case study, I think, on a part of this, but not the whole topic. And I'd love to talk about my experience in the U.S. government uh, during the Ebola response and, and how our institutions, both uh, multilateral and national, didn't, didn't work. But in the meantime, we will, I'll try to go through quickly what I prepared about antimicrobial resistance, which I think will be a very illustrative case of, of how can government leaders be persuaded to help. First, there, when you talk to scientists and medical people, they almost inevitably say, well, we know the answers to these questions. We know what to do. It's a question of political will. As though political will was a light switch that one could turn on or off and that um, this was something that maybe diplomats or, or policymakers were, were good at. Well, some of us are good at our jobs of putting our priorities onto other people's agenda. But what we need to do that is data and evidence. And using and publicizing data and evidence that would make the issues real to people's agendas, why should they care about them, and other things that would um, attract their attention. And again, on the antimicrobial resistance side, I did a little net search, and I thought there were two examples that would make what really is a, a global and, and sometimes sort of theoretical problem real to people that were making decisions. One about a woman in the US who died last year because she was resistant to all available antibiotics. And another that all of us can relate to in terms of family members or, or personal experiences, that very common procedures would be life-threatening within 30 years. This may not be within my lifetime, but almost all the rest of you in the room will still be here then. The other, second question I was asked to talk to, the role of the US in leading the way in corralling global and political financial support. The US is, the, in a way, and you, this is sobering to someone who represents the US, as, as many of you have it, in international meetings, that people really want to know, how do you solve this problem in the US? And our system, while grotesquely imperfect in, in many ways, actually is the reference point for many international discussions about how to address standards and how, how other countries should be prepared. And so very briefly, and again, this is on uh, antimicrobial resistance, but that we did put the data and evidence forward, and many of you worked on studies even before this, but the CDC report was very important in just putting in one place what we knew. 2014, we had a national strategy called the CARB. For US leadership to make a difference, and this is from the PEPFAR example on AIDS, that um, you need presidential leadership and interagency buy-in. There really has to be a role that is identified with each of the agencies. And I think in the Obama administration, CARB did that, and here were the things that agencies were called on to do. What you also need in the PEPFAR lesson for global leadership to work is a sustained financial commitment. CARB did not have that. And global reach. The people in embassies overseas have to say, this is important to our relations with many countries, perhaps not every country, but those countries that, that we've identified as key. And I have to say that that also has not been true with uh, antimicrobial resistance, and I think we could extrapolate to say that for most of the time in most circumstances has not been true for response to uh, pandemic threats and, and outbreaks. The US did appropriate funds domestically for the National Action Plan, and as KG well knows, the World Health Assembly 
um, approved a global action plan in which every country was to develop a national AMR plan, of which CARB was the US example. But there was no funding attached to this. And the WHO's um, role as not the main funder of most health activities in the world is something that um, Julie referred to and I think we all need to um, take seriously. But in response to the proposal that KG and his staff developed, 52 countries have enrolled in something called GLASS, the antimicrobial surveillance system, mostly high income countries. Of the 52, 40 actually provided the information they were supposed to provide, and 22 also provided data on level antibiotic resistance. That's progress. Uh, however, it does mean that there, there are, what, eight times as many countries that did not provide information, and that's not such good progress. Um, oops. So the CARB has been continued under the Trump administration, though without evident presidential leadership. And from the, but still, from the health and scientific point of view, even though there's a vacuum in the U.S. engagement, many of the multilateral fora, the U.S. role is very important because what we do at the national and at state and local level really is scrutinized by others to be a model and to say, here's a standard which, if we meet the U.S. standard, we're probably doing well by um, what we need for our own populations. Then, again, on the antimicrobial resistance side, We've made some progress on One Health and veterinary uses of antibiotics, uh, and again, in the Obama administration, but very much reinforced by Scott Gottlieb and the, the Trump administration there, to um, not to be used, not, antibiotics not to be used to promote growth in, in livestock. But, and I think all the world would agree that to treat disease in animals that are sick or even to control disease in a group of animals when some are sick is a legitimate use of the antibiotics. Where the real U.S. leadership is lacking is to prevent disease in animals that are at risk of becoming sick. U.S. Um, allows and, in fact, it's a very common practice to distribute antibiotics to healthy animals in a herd where none of them are sick. The Europeans have changed that policy and have made much more progress in controlling antibiotic resistance correlated. We don't actually know all the biological mechanisms of why this may be true. But um, from a policy point of view, again, I think there's enough information there that if the U.S. were really to want to lead on, on this one aspect of uh, microbials, this would be the next step to be taken. And then finally, we should be in our global health engagement be talking about stewardship and prescription practices, over-the-counter restrictions, and manufacturing practices in particular, the, many of the waste from manufacturing of antibiotics are in fact a problem in resistance as well. And finally, there, we're called on, and this very much has, uh, can be, again, um, projected onto the outbreaks and epidemics of market failures. How do we incentivize drug manufacturers or biotech researchers to look at where the next outbreak is going to be. And it is like finding, you know, Professor Plum in the ballroom with the lead pipe. You really, no one would have predicted Ebola in West Africa as the crisis we needed to face. But at the same time, the um, sense of who's in charge of this? How, how do we as a society, as a universe, um, set some priorities and give the best chance of having the countermeasures, the preventive measures that we need for what's likely to be the next outbreak. And that's equally true for antibiotics. There's a market failure in that um, who should finance this. But the, the industry's approach to us, and I have to say Merck, the company Merck bought out in this field was the first one to come and said, well, all we need is a $2 billion advanced market commitment, and then we'll develop the drugs. You own it, you, the US government or UWHO. And then you can figure out how it can be used uh, in, in proper stewardship. And I have to say that was not an attractive proposition to the US government. So well, we do need some better models, and, and some people are working on them. And finally, talk about global health security agenda and the joint external evaluations. Um, again, I, it was too narrow on AMR. The global health security agenda was set up in February 2014 before we knew Ebola was a problem. It was an attempt by Tom Frieden and Kathleen Sebelius to healthify security. I see people in the room who were well involved in this for, for, and did great work. Much of the money going to um, preparedness response to outbreaks uh, 
was from the Department of Defense and not well prioritized in terms of public health requirements. And so the global health security agenda was an attempt to get the public health people kind of ahead of the parade of US government engagement in all of this and with partners led by Finland in the first instance. Those um, uh, package, action packages from global health security agenda became very important when the international health regulations, which had been in effect for a decade, but which had not been taken very seriously and were only uh, responsible for self-reporting, um, were about 100 countries, I think, KG, came to WHO within the period of a year asking for help in preparedness and response to outbreaks. So whereas no one had really been eager for international involvement in there to seeing how they were doing, Ebola certainly woke all of us up to the need for that. And the joint external evaluations were GHSA's idea, but they are a WHO institution. And they've, as of today, they are starting the 90th joint external evaluation in Eswatini, the country once known as Swaziland. Um, U.S. has pledged to help 33 countries, the G7 altogether, 77 total countries. And these really are game changers in that there is now a standard of which the international health regulations are already binding on member states, but now are being really assessed and uh, gaps addressed. And finally, the last question, what's the one most important thing the United States government should do? And I echo what the other two speakers up here have said and others. Increase investment in global health research and preparedness and the global institution to carry out much of that work so that we Americans don't have to do it alone. We are, these are rules-based, knowledge-based international institutions of which we're the guarantors, we're often the chief financers, but if we ben benefit so much by having an international um, multilateral system that does take the lead role and can be a normative agency in this, the U.S. benefits, because otherwise it would be ad hoc and we very much would be carrying a an even more disproportionate burden of what would be needed to be done to invest in these um, crises or prevention of crises. Thanks very much.